You're listening to the Becoming More Me podcast with me, Teresa Lear Levine. You're already enough, but if you're anything like me, you thrive when you're stretching and developing yourself, creating more of the person you feel called to be. This podcast is here to inspire and support you. Let's release the negative, reinforce the positive, and elevate our vibe together as we tap into our limitless potential to transform and grow. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I got to say, I'm really excited about today's interview because it's with exactly the person who I wanted to be the very first guest to appear on my podcast show. Her name is Megan Eggleston, and we've known each other for a little over six years now, and she's had a big influence on my my business life and a lot of the personal developing that I have done. So I really wanted to honor that by having her on here to share some of her awesome wisdom and insights. Now, Megan is a mom of three and she's built a seven figure business as a top leader in health and wellness, MLM, multi-level marketing. She's currently launching a life coaching practice, which I know she's going to be so amazing at because she's already amazing at it. And she's very passionate about helping women to just courageously create what they really want to bring into their lives. Um, For me, I know that a lot of what she's helped me with has been getting out of my comfort zone, getting over the need to be perfect with what I put out there, setting better boundaries in my life, um, following my heart and really exploring my interests further and allowing all the different seasons of my life to just to be okay, to find acceptance there as I grow as an entrepreneur, a network marketer, a mom, a wife, a friend, all of those things. And Interestingly enough, just a piece of kind of my history that intertwines with hers is that it was at one of the retreats that we had with our team, because we're both part of the same multi-level marketing and network marketing business, where she hosted um, an EFT session for all of us. And although I had known and heard and tried the practice before, it never clicked with me until that particular retreat. And That is where my calling to develop all of this that is now snowballed into what I am doing really sparked. So I am forever grateful for that and just a, just a cool part of the story. So Megan, I'm so happy that you're here and I'm just excited to get to catch up because I feel like I haven't talked to you in ages. Also, how are you? I'm great. I'm excited to be here. This is actually my first time as a guest on a podcast and I feel super honored that I get to do it with you. Awesome. I'm just, I'm I'm happy that you're here. And I can't believe that you've never been on a podcast before. You have have so much wisdom to offer. Meg's very vocal in her, um, you know, social media stories and everything, and always has really good reflective and uh, deep thought kind of things to share, which is probably why I enjoy talking to her so much. And um, I know you're going through all of your life coach certifications and everything right now. And I was actually thinking about it this morning. I finally started reading um, James Allen's As a Man. Man thinketh. Have you ever read that? I have not. Okay. So it's, it's known as one of the top 10 personal development, self-help books of like all time. It's technically an essay that was written in 1903. And, um, but it got me thinking because I just started reading. I haven't finished it even. It's a short, it's a short read, but, um, it's all about, you know, thought obviously. And he talks about how, you know, mind is the master power that molds and makes and man is mind. And evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. He thinks in secret and it comes to pass environment is, but his looking glass. And it's just the whole book kind of has, it's just really good, like deep thought about the way we think and what happens because of our thoughts. And I know that, uh, we talked about how we could, you know, go into thought work and things today, especially deconditioning and such. And I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on thoughts. Yeah. I mean, no, that, that sounds amazing and something that I need to be reading because that's, a, that's exactly what's shaping my, you know, the steps that I'm taking in my life coaching business as I've been, like you said, been doing a lot of that work naturally with health and wellness, because we all, both of us know that health and fitness is not a product of not knowing exactly what to do as much as it is what's going on in our heads. Right. Um, and so that's really what's shaped me, like really wanting to go way deeper in helping women, like be, get really curious about 
those default thoughts that are happening and creating their current lives. Yeah. And I always find it so interesting that almost everybody I talk to that, that goes deeper and goes further with their business has some kind of a root in network marketing, multi-level marketing, or direct sales or affiliate marketing before they do it. There's a, this spark that it has, that it brings out like all of those things in us where we want to do and learn more. Have you found that too? Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, th- you know, that, that was definitely my experience and it sounds like yours too, but, um, it makes sense when you think about it, like you're forced to, you're, you're met, you're, you're face to face with a lot of things that have kept you stuck. And so it's like the first time I think I was really forced to identify some of these things that were keeping me in the current patterns as a 32 year old woman with, with a couple degrees and three children. I'm like, you know, wow, is this still the same stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Right. Right. <laughs> And then, we, and then there's still so much we don't know. But, exactly. yeah. So what led you down like your path? Like, where do you feel like you've started and grown to present time? Oh, good Lord. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I guess. Summarize. Not, yeah. Yeah. I'll do my best. Um, I guess, you know, it definitely goes back to starting a multi-level marketing business. I, I never saw myself in business. Uh, that's not entirely true. I guess I just never saw myself successful. Like in a way that was leading other people. Um, but I don't know what happened, but I guess I was doing this thing for fun while I had kids at home and was going to go back to work because I did have two degrees and I did have $36,000 in student loans to still pay off. Like can't, can't waste it. Can't waste it. Gotta go back. And that is the thought behind it. Right. Like I've got to go back to work and do that thing. And I, I kind of always knew I would like, I'm a, I like to work, but, um, at that time I had chosen to stay home. Um, and wanted to, and that was the plan. So this thing was just for fun. And I think as I was doing it and like coming up against like um, selling, <laughs> I was like, realize, I, I think I just got curious about like, what, why is this such a big deal? I believe in this stuff. Like I, like this is changing my life. Like what is the big deal? And I, so I realized that there was patterns of worrying about what people think, um, you know, I, I just, I just saw these same patterns coming back up. And I realized at 32 years old, like that was gonna, that was sad. If I didn't start to do something about it, then, you know, like if this patterns are going to recreate this, I, I think the story I've always said is like, I was still in high school. Like I saw that high school mindset of like wanting to be cool or wanting to fit in or wanting the cool girls to think I was cool, you know, um, they're hard patterns to, be- to break when you're not conscious right. of them, especially. That's right. And so that was really, that was really the catalyst for creating the business. And I wasn't even trying to create the business. I was just trying to get over that, that BS. Right. And so I didn't know where the business part was going to take me, but just the very goals I was setting, I getting, I was identifying these thought patterns. And like, I wanted to challenge was just those very, like that approach to like my business grew my business. And then I realized, holy crap, I am a business owner and I'm a good business owner. And I'm actually a leader who knew. <laughs> but it, you know, it didn't come from like, I'm going to go make six figures. Although I think that's still a great thought someone could work from and create in their life. It just wasn't my path. Now right. it might be now I might have, but like at that time, that's what, like, I started to realize I have all of these hangups around, um, money around success around a lot of things. And so it's just what's fueled every next step in my business, my business, not businesses, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, that's really summarizing a lot. There's a lot that's gone in, in between there, but that's really what catalyzed everything to yeah. where I am now. It's all super important work. And then sometimes, like you said, you know, you were 32 and you're having all these feelings. And then sometimes we go into this, oh gosh, you know, how did I not figure it out before then? And we get into like shame and regret and all sorts of other things that make us, but you know what? It's never too late. Right. I mean, you can always figure it out and move forward and make progress. Oh girl, I'm like 41. I'm like the next 40 years are going to be fantastic. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the forties are my favorite so far. So, and I hope I get to say the same thing about my fifties and all the I other decades that come there. I after. believe that. <laughs> I believe you think the same thing about 50, but like, oh my gosh, 50 is amazing. <laughs> oh, I hope so. It's going to be awesome. So how do you like to help people to break out of those patterns or what, what's helped you? Yeah. I mean, um, 
I've just had to start to get really clear with the, the narratives that are going on in my head. And I know this is like cliche sounding and I don't know how many like years I've heard journal, journal, journal. And I was like, I hate journaling. I hate writing. I'm an ADHD brain. It does not like to write because it, yes. the brain goes too fast. And it's, it's been my excuse um, for a long time is like, oh, my brain just worked too fast you know? <laughs> and I'm like, and so it's really been a practice and a challenge. But one I prefer that's- doing voice journaling for that same reason. Yeah. Cause I, the pen can't keep up with my head. And then I take my, whatever I put in voice and I go on, I let it transcribe online and then I can actually pull stuff out of it and make sense of it. Oh, I like that's that. kind of convoluted. And sometimes it seems like too much for just figuring out your thoughts, but if they're really important things to work through, that helps me. Cause I love putting the pen to paper, but I always feel like I've missed so much because I just couldn't get it out there. I would agree that that probably does happen. And so like, I don't get as much on paper as I would love to. So what I really do when I feel like there's something that's holding me back specifically, I pull out the one thought, you know, I pull out here, or, like, let me like dissect this and get curious about it. And, and then I start to reverse engineer, like a a thought that just sounds pretty like surface level, like, like getting deeper with it. Like, why, why do I think this? And sometimes I'm realizing some of these thoughts are like, they're not based in any truth. And then I start to just like choose, is this something that I want to, is this something that I want to continue to believe? Like this could have come from so many places, you know, the subculture that we're in in terms of our business culture or our larger, you know family culture or the largest, you know, American culture. And I start to realize so many of the things that I just kind of default operate from are, I've not been curious about. Yeah. And And we often don't take the time to question the thought and to say, how does that thought make me feel? Right. And like, what if I just like, let it go. And I think a lot of things that we think that a lot of these thoughts, we actually believe are facts. We think they're just true. Because we haven't questioned that either. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But in, in this world, like, how do you find the time and the processes to work through that in a way that gets your results? Like, that's what I come up against with people all the time. And part of the reason why I love EFT, because it's fast, because so many people mm-hmm. are like, you know, I know I have this thing going on, but how am I going to get through it? How do I find the time to voice record or dissect or journal and then right. pull it out and then question it. And do I, am I going to ask the right questions? You know? Right. No, I can see that. Do you have any processes that you like for that? Um, I mean, I've definitely loved to, to be introduced to EFT and I definitely use it as one modality that helps. Um, you know, for me, it's, I've learned that there are certain thoughts that I just have to practice over and over again. You know, we have, I don't know how is it. It's like, 30,000 thoughts in a day. And like, so Probably I low. recognize there's no, way. yeah. Was that? Yeah. Yeah. Probably a low number. Um, yeah. I, I recognize that there's absolutely zero way that I'm going to pick apart all of them that I can tackle all of them. And some of them I actually like, and I want to keep it. I want them to remain on default. You know, I want them to remain right. on autopilot. Right. Um, and I've just had to let a lot go and just recognize what's coming up in me today. And as I come upon those things, I see that are patterns. Those are the ones that I start to take more time with, which I might, you know, do have a more of an EFT practice around, a tapping practice around, or I know which ones are going to require the most practicing and the most attention, the most consciousness, um, recognizing that I just cannot be um, like. There's a lot of undesirable or unnecessary thoughts that are, you know, running right now. But um, all I know is something's holding me up today, and that's what I can right. bring to the journal, to the voice journaling, to the tapping practice, to that um, biggest you know, nagging point. voice or that biggest obstacle thing that's holding you back. That's making it yes. hard for you to move forward. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I always recommend that too. Cause it's like, we can't deal with everything all at once. It's gotta be layers or chunks or however you want to look at it that you work yes. through. But, you know, I, I love that we both kind of started with the whole fitness journey. Cause I always find parallels with fitness and health to the, the mental journey. I feel like it totally. should come the other way around, but we always, it seems like people tend to find it through fitness first. Um, well, if we I found the mindset different. stuff first, the fitness stuff would be a lot easier, but once we figure out the fitness, we realize how much the mindset, you know, follows the same, a similar pattern of growth and 
compounding and benefits over time. Even if, you know, you just spend a little bit of time each day working out, spend a little bit of time, you know, working your mind on those you know particular thoughts that are bothersome each day. And all of a sudden in the course of a year, you've overcome 365 thoughts that were in your way before, or you got 365 different workouts or ways of moving your body in before, you know, I don't know. It's, it all yeah. adds up. I wonder if that's just, you know, something that's cultural within, um, you know, women, that is the way that culture has defined a lot of our value and has told what has, it has told us to pay attention to is our, you know, how we look. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I think that's just kind of a natural way that a lot of people find that thought work is because somebody has told them the world, their parents, you know, a man that their body's a problem and, or their body is their value in the world or, you know, how it looks. And so I, I think that's, we don't like the, to work on our mental health is that is not culturally. I mean, I guess that's definitely becoming more of a conversation that we're having, I think now, but the women that I know you and I have worked with, um, that's not been what we've been has shown has been valued. Many of us have not been grown up, right. grown up to, to learn how to, <laughs> how to manage our emotions or even that it's okay to have emotions and express them and feel them and explore them, sit there and look pretty. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, I believe probably the majority of the clients I've worked with on health and fitness didn't come to me because they wanted a mindset shift around it. No, not at all. They wanted to lose some pounds or tone something up or, you know, change something in the physical realm. But those things also people sometimes feel are easier to measure than thought progress. Totally. It is. And that's true. There is, it is a lot more easy to quantify your success and qualify your success. You have something physical or visible or a number or metric to say, this has changed. And I can, you know, (laughs) after that, I always think that the amount of consciousness that we gain as we continue working on our mindset allows us to quantify the progress we're making better. Totally. If that makes sense, because it's easier once you become more conscious to be able to reflect back and see how far you've come, even if it is all in thought and not a before and after picture, it's right. still, it's its own before and after picture. Maybe, you know, it's the way that you used to react to, you know, stressful situations with your kids or spouse or something. And now when the same thing happens, all of a sudden it's a totally different outcome. And, but it takes that consciousness to see the before and after in that. 100%. I would agree. Yeah. So what other, what other thought type work do you think people need to be doing these days? Like what would make it just a huge difference in somebody's day if they did this instead of that? Um, the, are you asking like, what is the type of thought work or what is like a practice? Um, because I mean, I feel like what I'm coming up against with life coaching clients is it seems like it's one of two things. And sometimes I think these two things kind of actually go together. It's people pleasing is what is pervasive in most women's, um, uh, the obstacles that they have to create what they want. Um, and the other is just, um, not really knowing what they want. Like I'm, you know, I'm talking to a lot of women in their, you know, mid to late thirties, forties who have come to this place where they recognize they do want something more different. Um, not that they're not thankful for the lives that they have, but mm-hmm. they recognize how much of their life has just been kind of shaped by everybody else. And they haven't actually like, and now they realize they do want to pursue something, but they're not even sure what that is. Right. Like, I feel like so many people are just so disconnected from what they even want because they haven't been, they haven't thought about it. They've been conscious enough with their own desires because it's been shaped by the expectations around them. So I feel like that's the area where I think a lot of women can start to get really curious. Like so people pleasing and indecision pretty much. Yes. I think. Yeah. And I, and I see those going together in a lot of ways because yeah, yeah, for sure. So how do you like to speak to people pleasing? (laughs) That's always a fun (laughs) one, I think. Yeah. So I don't know that I have all the, like, I would love to speak a lot about this, but, um, <laughs> um, do you think people pleasing has a lot to do with boundaries? You know, that that's definitely an action that you can take from, you know, with people pleasing that helps, but like 
I think the first thing you have to do is to get to the thought before you can really just change your behaviors. Um, and I think that's what a lot of us try to do is we want to just go and change our behaviors. I should have boundaries or I should do X, Y, and Z. But if you're not really truly understanding what thoughts you're having that are creating the people pleasing, you're never going to actually change yourself. And it's not going to feel really good when you do make those changes. And so like, I want to know, I want to help you get to like, what are you thinking is going to happen? I just had a, you know, a conversation with a client yesterday and I was like, what if you had told this person? No, you know, like, what are, what are you afraid would have happened? And it, it, you know, we were able to break down and I've had, and it breaks down differently for a lot of people. Sure. Exactly. That fear is. And so I think that's what you have to like, get clear with is what is it that you're thinking you're going to lose? Um, and then you'll realize, you know, and was your client able to identify that or was that difficult to figure out? Uh, no, it was, it was pretty easy. Once I asked the questions and she just like asked herself, I don't think she really needed me. It's just that she hadn't sat down and I asked the question, what am I afraid of losing? And it was community. She thought she was going to lose the connectedness and the community that she had in the relationship. She thought she needed those people for her worth, her love and support. And what she realized was I'm actually not creating intimacy, intimacy with people that I'm inauthentic with. So she was not being her actually, she realized I'm actually losing connection by being something fake to make them love me. And I think so many of us don't recognize that's what's happened is we're actually living inauthentically to get connection, but how real and true is that connection when we're our false aversion of ourselves to get it. Right. And I don't think we get deep enough to recognize that's what we're craving, but we're actually undermining intimacy. It's very true. And it gets really complicated. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. And that's why we don't go there because it's not comfortable. It does not feel good to connect with those parts of yourself. It does not feel good to, it really doesn't. It's not, it's, it's uncomfortable to recognize, to feel those feelings. Of, of, you know, of potential rejection. Yeah. We don't want to like equally or more uncomfortable to feel like you're in a fog and you have no idea what's going on in your life and you're disconnected from everything though. too. Ex- exactly. Because that's the alternative discomfort. And it comes down to that choice of which discomfort, but we don't, we're so in our patterns that we don't recognize that we have, but that there is an alternative or that is. The yeah. choice. I think a lot of people don't even really know who they are authentically. 100%. Because it's so foggy. And I think that also plays into that other point that you were starting to talk about, about people not knowing what they want because they That's don't, exactly they don't really know who they are. That's exactly it. And, you know, I know I have ways I like to help people get clear on that. Do you have things that you like to do to help people find more of their authenticity or to, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like that word's such a buzzword these days. <laughs> I know. I agree. know. Like, what does that even mean? I, like, it's like the definition's gotten so like washed out that it's like, I yeah, know. I agree. And, and, and I can really relate to this. Uh, I can really relate to this feeling um, and feeling stuck, <laughs> like feeling stuck as if like, how do I figure it out? Um, and one of the things I, I help people do, or I try to help them to do is look at how they're spending their days and their time. And, and like, if your day is taken up by everybody else, how will you ever even find like what you want or what you want to create? And because it just seems it's easier when someone else wants it and they already know what they want from you for you just to fall into that. So I have, I have them look at like what they're doing to create space for that, to create space for relationships with their girlfriends, or even just an hour to take a walk, to be in their own thoughts, to be in their own, like they may not know what and it may not be that they're going to create a new business or a new passion, hobby or whatever, but if they don't even spend time with themselves, they're thinking for themselves, how will they ever get to know themselves? And so I think it starts there with, with intentional time that is just for you to be with you. Yeah. We hate having to slow down in order to get traction so that we can speed up. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it happens to me all the time. And I realize, oh gosh, in order to like move the needle on this or that, I've got to actually like 
just kind of relax and reflect and actually like review what I've been doing on that particular area of my life. And then I'll be able to figure out what the next step is, but finding the time to do that can be really hard when you have all these things that are like nagging at you and you know, all that urgency culture and all that stuff. Yeah. That's just bouncing off of you all day. I think that urgency, like responding to those other things gives us some kind of immediate sense of feedback that we're productive or valuable. And I think that's why it's hard for us. Yeah, it is always going to be nagging at us. And so if we take the bait, there's some kind of feedback that says, Hey, you have worth here. You have value here. And that's attractive to us when we, when the alternative is there's nothing to show for me spending time with myself or me being like, you know, and that's a hard, that is a hard pattern to, to shift. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, These days, the, the do not disturb mode on my phone and my computer and auto responders that let people know, <laughs> like, haven't forgotten about you, but I'm not getting to you right now. Things like that are like my best friend, because Absolutely. that's the only way I feel like I can create the time and space to actually do the work that is going to help my family, help my business, all the things. There are a lot of tools at our disposal if we are really intentional to look for them. Yes. And there's a lot of time wasters too. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I do it. I know I do. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's tough. I mean, we, we both have ADHD. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the squirrels are everywhere and we're always finding our attention called to other places or we're just getting excited about yeah. other stuff that we feel yeah. really passionate about. And it's like, it can be really difficult to know. I like to say, you know, when to quit it or when to grit it. And, you know, I think figuring out like when to, when to abandon the ship and when to actually like, you know, start bailing out and and figuring out how to make it work is is a really fine line. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Because I think the more that we take on, the more that we actually have to stop doing too, in order to, to get clear. And I think, gosh, we could all use better processes around like, you know, determining like, is this worth my time or not? Yeah. And especially like right in the moment. In the moment. Yeah. I think that's the hardest part is in the moment is, do I trust the prefrontal cortex that decided on this task or do I trust this creative urge that's telling me this is what, you know, this is more aligned with your vision. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so many of the things that we're working on, be it business or family, they don't have immediate results. So it can be really easy to say, oh, I guess it's not working. And then to quit it when you should really grit it or, you know, vice versa to hang on to something so long when it's not working that you have regrets or, you know, loss of income or whatever comes with, you know, sticking with the bad decision. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. How how do you like to make your decisions, especially like when you're feeling like things are like really like distracted in your world? This is a big one for me because I do like to you know, be super efficient with my time and plan out my days and times and be like that responsible business owner. But I'm also, and it feels so good when that goes well. Yeah. Right. (laughs) But I also am ADHD and I hate to even use that label a ton because I think it's, it can be such a blame, but like, I'm just saying, I know that my brain works this way and that I I don't see it. It's a superpower in my opinion. Oh, for sure. And so sometimes it's creative urges and it's like, you know, when I, cause when I hit that creative urge and it's the right thing, I go into that hype focus and I can create a lot of amazingness. And so it's, it can be a gift, but sometimes it's because this task is really uncomfortable for me and I just don't want to do it. So let me tell myself a story and this other thing is better, you know? And so it's like, how do you decide between the two? And so something that I've come down to is to like, is to be careful that I'm not telling myself self that story by right, like making a, a conscious decision. So here, like to like write down and do the thought work, you know, is there, is there an uncomfortable feeling that I just don't want to do this task right now? Like, what am I trying? Is there a discomfort that I'm trying to avoid? And am I consciously making this, this making it conscious because my prefrontal cortex, my, you know, executive brain, when it was at its best decided this was what you were going to do today. But my, you know, my primitive brain, you know, my lizard brain is like, Oh no, this is uncomfortable. Let's go do this. Right. Um, I'm going to keep you safe. Right. And so it's like, let me just make sure my primitive brain was not overriding my prefrontal cortex. You know, like I want to like, so I to catch myself and I don't always do it. Sometimes I'm like my leisure brain wins, yeah. but um, it's like, so the way that I do this, so that I, cause, cause you know, what happens is no matter what I do, there's guilt or shame could follow. And that's what I'm trying to like, that's what I think I'm, is really such a pervasive thing that I keep 
that I think keeps a lot of, you know, growth and progress for us. And so I just want to make sure that this was a conscious decision on my behalf, you know, like on my brain's behalf. And so I just pause and make sure that this is conscious that I'm doing this consciously with my, you know, my brain, my executive function is coming in and saying, okay, lizard brain, like you're actually, you know, this is, this is actually where we belong or okay, lizard brain, I'm in control. We're going to follow through with the calendar today. And this is something that we can do afterwards. So, right. but sometimes that creative urge was aligned yes. and I can make that conscious choice and feel like, you know what, this silly task, these emails, I, I can get back to them tomorrow. It's okay. If it's 24 or 48 hours, uh, like I am on a roll right here. I'm going to ride this way because I know what happens with my magic. Yes. And I, you know, and I embraced it. So it's, that is a practice. And that's one of those practices I have to, you know, I have to continue practicing to catch that. You know, I spiral. can feel that a hundred percent. I, I have the same thing happen all the time. And it's like, you start to kind of feel like you've been like taken off course on like this awesome roller coaster. And you're like, do I ride it? Or do I try to like come back to, I don't want to, I try to, I try to get conscious about it. And sometimes I win and sometimes I lose kind right. of thing, but yeah, I don't right. really know if, if either is really so bad, but yeah, right. I mean, it, you come back to that whole, like, I did, I did a whole episode last week on like procrastination versus prioritization. Or then you start worrying about like, are you being lazy or are you being like restoratively restful okay. or, and then it's, it, it comes all back to that whole idea that we started thoughts. It's all about the thoughts and mm -hmm. like what you're feeding yourself about what you're doing and getting conscious about it. And it's so hard. <laughs> Yeah. And then accepting whatever it was, whether, whether you whether you procrastinated or you didn't, or whether I took the squirrely brain ride or not, like yes. just, you know, having acceptance for it and yeah. you know, in, in informing my next processes. And I think the more I accept it, the less I'm held captive by my shame and guilt. And I actually consciously create more of what I want. For sure. I believe that hundred percent too. And I mean, ADHD aside, I mean, just being moms, you of three and me of four kids, like there's always something coming at us to take us off course, you know, even when we think we have the day planned out well. And I think that's why those days that are like so productive when we actually like feel like we've checked the right boxes and everything feel like so euphoric because they happen so infrequently. Right. It's true. You know, I mean, we, we can have the best laid intentions, but you just never know when somebody's going to miss the bus or, you know, get the sniffles or, you know, just have a bad day, or you just want to like take the family out for ice cream. Right. You know? I think that ideal day is fun. It's, it's fun to put on paper and stuff and plan for, but you and I both recognize it is so rare. And the point isn't that we create the perfect days every day and which is why I think a lot of people don't even plan much anymore. It's like, well, it's always going to get screwed anyway. And it's like, mm, when, if that's, that's the way you approach it, then exactly. And that, if that's the way we approach it, then we don't get to create what we want. It's like, we accept that. Yes. Something may, and very likely will get hijacked today, but you know, here's the ideal that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to aim for, and I'm going to consciously make a decision. Oh, my kid being sick or my kid needing a snack is something I'm choosing right now instead of this or, or not, you know, right. Uh, but rather than be without like, a plan though, it's like, you can't even attempt to make progress. Right. right. And exactly. I always feel like when, you know, and I, I do make lists, I'm a lot more uh, loose about them any more than I ever was, you know, cause I used to be like a slave to it and that mm -hmm. felt horrible. And yeah. that came with a lot of bad thoughts and stuff, but I, I can look at my list and know like what's imperative and what can wait right. and try to enjoy the other stuff that comes along during, along the way, because, you know, even if we do plan out our day, we don't really know what the best thing is or what needs okay. to happen in our lives all the time. Sometimes that just has to come from elsewhere. It's really cute that we really think we get to like plan it all out. So yeah. <laughs> and you know, we have, we have so little control over so yeah. few so things funny. Yeah. and <laughs> we're trying to like, just grasp at it all the time. And it doesn't, doesn't help us or anybody else really, but it's so, I, I find it so fun to think about the way that we think. And I know that you do, I do too, too, which yeah. is part of the reason I knew we would have a, a good <laughs> conversation and, and hit on some things that I know are, cause a lot of pain for people, yes, unfortunately. Yeah. And it yeah. doesn't have to be that way. There's so many ways to work through it. And, you know, you and I both know all the answers are already inside of us. 
but Mm -hmm. having somebody to talk to, having a life coach, having some kind of a a practitioner or counselor or somebody to talk to can make it so much more efficient, which comes back to the whole idea that when we're busy and when we're trying to accomplish big things, we don't feel like we have time. So instead of going it alone to know that we have somebody that can guide us, that can see things from a different perspective, that can bring out and really pull those things that we really need to get out of our way so that Mm -hmm. we can make amazing progress. I think that's the beauty in, in working with people and more so than just like having a friend to talk to or right. a spouse or somebody that really doesn't even deserve to hear all the weird stuff that's happening in your head <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, of- you know, if, um, if people want to hear more and see more about what you do, where should they go? Uh, you know, currently I'm taking, um, some free coaching sessions, um, or, and, um, I am developing some pack, some coaching sessions, some co- coaching uh, packages. But right now, if somebody just wants to have a consult or a one-off call with me, um, there's a link that I think you're going to share in the show notes. Um, but my website is meganegelson.com. And um, you might see some more of what I'm offering there, but you can always, always, always find me on social media and especially on Instagram at just Megan Eggleston. Um, yes. My first and last name, M-E-G-H-A-N-E-G-G-L-E-S-T-O-N because I'm pretty... I'm pretty present there on my feed and in my stories. Yeah. Yes. I love Meg's stories. They're always fun to watch. And she always has good insights and shares so much of what's going on in her day, but I am so grateful for your time today. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with me to have this chat. And, um, thank you for everything you've done to inspire me in my journey so far. It really does. It means so much to me. And I'm so thrilled that you get to be the first guest that I'll be featuring on the Becoming Thank Mormon you. podcast. Thank you so much. This was super, um, super fun. And the reason that I've not done other podcasts is not because I haven't wanted to, it's because it hasn't been aligned and this was 100% an alignment. And I'm just, it's a thrill to be able to do this with you. So thanks. That's good. And I I know when we talked about it, you, you talked about how, you know, you weren't really sure what we talk about or didn't feel ready. And I kind of had to giggle because it's exactly the thing that we're always getting over. Exactly. You no, know, so. it's like <laughs> it's yes. exactly the thing that like you and I are like, yeah, I just don't know if I'm ready to do that. Oh well, screw it. Here we go. <laughs> like, so sure. <laughs> I, I applaud you for doing what you always do so well, which is just like, oh well, here I go. And yep. <laughs> uh, and trusting in me not to lead you astray. So yes. thanks again, Meg. Thank, Thank you. you everybody for listening. Thanks so much for listening. If you love this episode, please share it with a friend or post on social media and tag me so I can personally connect and thank you. Until next time, keep taking bold and brave action steps towards becoming more of who you want to be in this world. You are capable, you are worthy, and you are enough. Keep shining your light.